Hi everybody, so I'm practicing a little bit of social distancing. I was supposed to be doing a teach out tonight at the Birkbeck UCU picket. Um, this is the placard that I made for the picket and the subject of my teach out is um, what can science fiction teach us about eco-catastrophe or the coming catastrophe. Um, obviously this is a subject that is now very painfully relevant uh, and that is why I'm going to be presenting it to you here from my garden. So here goes. With an homage to uh, Bob Dylan's subterranean homesick blues, of course. Um, so I'm actually not going to focus on the dystopian end of the science fictional and apocalyptic spectrum, as perhaps you might be expecting, but I'm going to think about hopeful and possibly even utopian texts. For those of us who may desire the end of capitalism, post-apocalyptic fiction has some useful lessons about how we might rebuild society amid the wreckage and how we could imagine new or better communities. Studies of post-apocalyptic literature often invoke Mary Shelley's The Last Man as the subgenre's originary text. Shelley's three-volume novel relates a chilling, future-oriented story of plague-like global viral pandemic. <laughs> it's probably my most relevant text today. Um, and in this novel, most of humanity becomes wiped out, um, but it is witnessed by a survivor, the last man, who is immune to the plague. And as he moves around the English countryside, he returns time and again um, to London, which is a kind of gauge of apocalyptic um, collapse. As the population dwindles, Lionel Verney, the last man, makes preparations to set up a fortified compound in Windsor Castle. <laughs> Some from among the family of man must survive, he says, and he reasons that Windsor Castle will provide them with the haven and retreat for the wrecked bark of human society. It's definitely odd, um, but ultimately Lionel's plans to set up a kind of commune in Windsor Castle are thwarted and he is left as the lone survivor wandering around the world in sublime romantic isolation like Frankenstein's outcast creature or Coleridge's ancient mariner. So whilst we might look back now at Shelley's novel as the first of a growing number of texts dedicated to imagining the destruction of mankind, it's actually interesting to note that contemporary reviewers considered the book to be, quote, sickening and diseased, um, the book that is as much as the actual subject matter, they said it was full of stupid cruelties. I think these uh, reviewers at the time underestimated the power of the speculative imagination and what we might now call science fiction and how this could actually prepare us for the coming catastrophe. Not only is there an enjoyable element to the imagination of disaster when enacted at a safe distance within a book rather than in real life, there might also be practical lessons to be gleaned here as well. M.P. Shields' 1901 novel, The Purple Cloud, which was first serialized in the Royal Magazine, is uh, more on the side of enjoyment, arguably, than practical lessons, it has to be said, um, unless you count learning how to blow up London with a series of homemade bombs. It's quite a wacky book. Adam Jefferson is a young doctor with a private practice on Harley Street who becomes obsessed by pole fever and joins an Arctic expedition to the North Pole. Whilst attempting to reach the pole, there's a mysterious purple cloud which washes over the entire planet and asphyxiates everybody, wiping out uh, the entirety of um, humanity. And of course, we might remember that around this time uh, in 1883, there'd been the famous Krakatoa volcanic eruption, um, uh, which inspired perhaps M.P. Shield's narrative. Adam himself is actually um, the only, well, we think the only survivor um, because he's up at the North Pole and the poisonous cloud freezes um, whilst he's uh, wandering around the ice and therefore somehow miraculously he survives. On finding all of his fellow expedition crew dead, he sets out to return south to Europe, on the way encountering numerous ghost ships, whalers, steam barges, colliers, dredgers, frigates, all of dead crew described grotesquely as a liquid cemetery. At Dover, he commandeers an abandoned train carriage and he drives up to London. Notice again, we keep going to capital cities like London to see the wreckage. 
um, and he, seen, he notes on the journey there's exuberant vegetation in the three months since the purple cloud first appeared. So, might the apocalypse be enjoyable? Seems a rather ethically dubious question to pose today, but nevertheless, after travelling around the UK and just establishing that he thinks he is the last man, in an increasingly lonely and dreamlike state, he starts to imagine himself as some sort of king of the world in the model of an imperial sultan. He declares that he will ravage and riot in my kingdom, and like the late Caesars of Rome, Jefferson assumes the dress of an oriental monarch and decides to destroy the capital by laying a series of bombs with homemade time fuses. The night of the bombing in London is described in his first person narration as a gargantuan orgy, um, and I quote, Looking directly south, I could recline at ease in the red velvet easy chair and see. Soon after midnight, there was a sudden and very visible increase in the conflagration. On all hands, I began to see blazing structures soar with grand hurrahs on high. My spirit more and more felt and danced deeper mysteries of sensation, sweeter thrills. What do we actually learn from this passage? Is it just how to enjoy apocalyptic destruction? I think this um, is something that we could call an armchair apocalypse. Shields' narrator literally sits in a red velvet armchair and he watches the chaos unfold, having set his network of bombs across the city. Um, shortly after this passage, he even plays Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries on a nearby harp before finally passing out in a gluttony of orgiastic devastation. So there's definitely an irreverent pleasure to be had here in the kind of delicious awfulness of this apocalypse, this grand melodrama of ending everything, or what Susan Sontag called in her 1965 essay, The Imagination of Disaster, a primitive gratification. So in some senses then, The Purple Cloud might be considered to be a novel ahead of its time. Indeed, with the inviting cellars of champagne, the luxurious empty mansions, the lack of much plot and the general sense of decadent abandonment, the novel seems to conform pretty closely to what science fiction writer Brian Aldiss later called the cosy catastrophe. Uh, Brian Aldiss defines this as a story in which, quote, the hero should have a pretty good time, a girl, free sweets at the Savoy, automobiles for the taking, whilst everyone else is dying off. A good example of this kind of, sorry, my fingers are so cold out here, cosy catastrophe and its armchair apocalypse is John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids. The novel opens with a mysterious comet landing on Earth which causes blindness in the majority of the population and the only exception are people like our narrator Bill who um, had his eyes bandaged in hospital at the time of the attack. So this leads instantly to anarchy, foraging, scavenging, new gangs and later on tribal communities people dying en masse of hunger and infection, the outbreak of a plague, and the rapid colonisation of the countryside by the dangerous bioengineered plant-like triffids. However, for Wyndham's protagonists, Bill and Josella, actually this kind of apocalypse um, gives some sort of hope and the possibility of a fresh start. Bill feels a new lease of life, we are told. Released from his job in the city in a large company, he gains a sense of purpose and agency. The open countryside, he says, quote, was not like the towns, sterile, stopped forever. It was a place where one could work and tend and still find a future. And similarly, we find in Doris Lessing's 1974 apocalyptic novel, Memoirs of a Survivor, this same curiously positive or even proto-utopian ciphers of a world that's actually improved by apocalyptic collapse. The novel combines psychoanalysis with Langian uh, psychiatry in its um, striking kind of psychopolitics, which exposes capitalist society in the late 1960s and 1970s as exploitative and alienating. And if we leave aside the very surreal ending of the novel, there's some sort of astral ascent towards the oneness of theosophical Sufism, we might note that the apocalyptic advantages introduced by the gangs of feral children and the lower class neighbours who colonised um, this bourgeois neighbourhood um, actually gives us something quite utopian. 
Indeed, they're described as being the most suited social group to adapt to post-civilised life, that is, life after civilization. And they represent what the author describes as a complete liberation from civilization, in which, as she writes, all property worries are gone, all sexual taboos gone, free, free at last from what was left of civilization and its burdens. And this brings us to Octavia Butler's 1993 novel, The Parable of the Sower. Set in a near future America in 2025, we find a book that details um, unerringly, presciently, societal breakdown amid the increasingly catastrophic weather events caused by global warming, but also, of course, the accelerated class inequality in a near future America. We have rich families who sequester themselves in defended gated communities and the lower middle classes erect walls and fortifications around their neighbourhood blocks. They organise patrols, they arm themselves with guns, they undertake target practice to defend themselves. And meanwhile, the lump and poor are forced just to live on the streets at the mercy of routine murder, robbery, gang rape and all kinds of very nasty things. So despite all this and how apocalyptically glim it undeniably is, the protagonist, Lauren, is a defiantly utopian figure. She's the teenage daughter of a Baptist minister in a tight-knit black community. She develops her own religious system that she calls Earthseed. And it's founded on the principles of inevitable, continual change and a pragmatic approach to community building from the bottom up. From the small beginnings of just two followers, Lauren gradually establishes a travelling community of survivors who know how to care for and how to protect each other. And this requires an apocalyptic kind of autodidacticism. Lauren reads as much as she can. This is a world where books are very hard to come by and there's increasing illiteracy. But she manages to find enough material to teach herself, for example, about the European bubonic plague. plague sorry. As she says, and I quote, it took a plague to make some of the people realise that things could change. Pretty chilling right now. This research on survivalism includes preparing herself for handling medical emergencies, thinking about how to utilise the natural resources of the Californian landscape in terms of reviving forgotten skills like plant cultivation, um, drawing on indigenous recipes for making food from unusual but available ingredients. So. Um, for example, she eats bread made out of acorns from oak trees. She says, I realise I don't know very much. None of us knows very much, but we can all learn more. Then we can teach one another. We can stop denying reality or hoping it will go away by magic. So this brings us to our crucial question. This is sticking together a little bit. <laughs> it's like being on Blue Peter. What's in Lauren's backpack? Her earthquake pack, the euphemism she uh, uses to describe it, is an emergency kit in a rucksack that she can hide in a safe place, preferably outside of her compound in case of a breach. And it stores all of the things that are essential for her survival. Recipes, old roadmaps, her survival notes that she's been um, collecting. Um, and uh, this reminds us again of the importance of information and of education in this collapsing world. There are things in there that she could barter or trade if she needs to, like a um, spare pair of shoes, which is an incredibly valuable commodity at this time. There are toiletries that are hard to get hold of when she travels on the road. Things like lip balm, tampons, condoms, aspirin, soap, toothpaste. And there's also plantable raw seed, so she can start a garden whenever the community settles and she has to regularly replace this so it doesn't go out of date. I think one of the most striking parts for me of the novel, um, reading this recently, has been a very weird experience, was when her father, before he dies, asks Lauren, do you think our world is coming to an end? And uh, she replies, just in her head, no, I think your world is coming to an end, and maybe you with it. Okay, so next up, we have N.K. Jemison's uh, apocalyptic um, trilogy, the Broken Earth trilogy, which builds on, I think, this kind of apocalyptic autodidacticism, this sort of self-programme of education that Lauren gives us in um, the Octavia Butler narrative. So in the Broken Earth uh, world, for thousands of years, um, a declining population has endured a desperate cycle of apocalyptic seasons, each of which has its own eco-catastrophe, 
Um, we have, for example, terrible volcanoes, massive um, earthquakes, ash clouds, uh, ser triggering series of tsunamis, and then rendering entire continents and coastal regions completely uninhabitable. It's a cycle that was initially triggered, according to legend, by Father Earth's anger at humanity. This is um, a, a fantasy series, as, as well as being science fiction. So as the situation disintegrates in the first novel during the uh, fifth season, our protagonist, Essam, has to decide how to live after the entire of her social order has collapsed. Like Lauren, she is forced to reconsider everything she has been taught by the previous generation, with its ideology of um, racial segregation uh, uh, between humans and origines who practice orogeny. I'm not sure anyone knows how to pronounce that. Um, origines are people who can manipulate the earth. They can actually kind of cause earthquakes themselves and it, if they can't control their abilities, but if they can control their abilities, they can actually protect people in their communities by preventing earthquakes. So everything in this narrative then changes during a season as uh, Essam learns, and the biggest change of all is learning to trust other people. As we've seen with Octavia Butler's The Parable of the Sower then, this is not a fixed community with a settled location. This is a community on the move. They're forced to travel. They have to leave um, the place in which they're living to try and find somewhere safe where they can start over. It's described not really as a community anymore, just a group of like-minded travellers collaborating to survive. Um, I probably don't have time to go into this, but <laughs> there are a number of fantasy kind of not human creatures in this novel who are made of stone and are called stone eaters, um, and they can assume the appearance of humanity. They're seemingly immortal, uh, they're mysterious, they manage to sort of move through the layers of the earth. Um, and uh, in collaborating with Essen, she starts to become like them, and so, <laughs> spoiler, over the course of the trilogy, she starts to become stone. In becoming stone, for those Deleuzeans out there, you might appreciate the reference, Essen learns to shift her perception and finally um, understand an intricate network of connected energy that continually pulses all around her. It flickers, quote, in wild, veiled patterns, the cells and particulates etched out by the lattice that connects them. So as a process of becoming stone and understanding this kind of connectedness with the earth and with other forms of energy, she finally is able to undo that sort of strict, rigid ideological conditioning which had trained her to become a professional origin. Um, and uh, she starts to understand how there might be a future for her and her community. Wait, my hands are so cold. Okay, so this brings us to Cory Doctorow's 2017 novel, Walk Away. It offers us um, a different problem in the apocalypse, and that is what would we do with ourselves when uh, automation has finally stolen all of our jobs? Are we going to remain techno serfs at the mercy of algorithmic computational capitalism with its obeisance to money and power, privilege, and whiteness? Or are we going to manage to finally harness these technologies and liberate ourselves from the drudgery of routine, menial, uh, and even perhaps highly skilled labour? As Aaron Bastani in his provocatively titled book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, a manifesto, suggests um, the foundations right now are cohering for a society beyond both scarcity and work. In um, the near future vision that Doctorow provides us in Walkaway then, the unemployed global lump and proletariat that automation has produced through that euphemistic term technological displacement or stealing all of their jobs. This, um, this kind of unnecessary act, uh, this unemployed class, have decided they don't have anything more to lose and they simply walk away from capitalist reality. In this utopia then, 3D print technology has been um, extended, we have wet printers to produce food, medicine, um, uh, also manufacturing food um, in lab-grown fungal cultures, um, and everybody, uh, bizarrely, has the requisite coding abilities <laughs> to continuously improve um, software underpinning these automatic, automatic processes, to fix bugs, to log improvements, and to build their own alternative version of the internet. So it offers us then uh, definitely a post-scarcity, but also a post-capitalist utopia, um, and eventually people figure out how to upload their consciousness online and to cheat death. 
Um, they imagine all different kinds of new communities, as we found with Lauren in Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. The characters then also understand community to be a continually evolving, growing, almost like a kind of organic uh, social unit. It's required to move, it has to start over, it becomes um, peripatetic. So finally then, this brings me to my last example, which is Lars von Trier's 2011 film Melancholia, a lush, genre-defying, end-of-the-world epic about depression and about the moment of total apocalyptic annihilation as a result of um, the collision of uh, an oncoming planet. So whilst the, um, the subject matter of this film might sound distinctly anti-utopian, critics have noted that despite this sort of bleak nihilism of it, it's actually quite possible to come away from this film, as one reviewer said, feeling light, rejuvenated, unconscionably happy. Um, I've been thinking recently about how I might read a, a science fiction film like this um, it, with a kind of utopian analysis. Uh, and one thing stood out to me in particular um, as, as an odd scene <laughs> that I'm referring to as Justine's naked bathing scene. Um, for those of you who know the film, you may remember there's a particular um, moment. Um, late in the evening, uh, Justine, played by Kirsten Dunst, is sort of drawn towards uh, the, the planet's blue light. Uh, we see her sort of walking somnambulantly across the lawn, followed at a distance by her sister Claire, who is played by Charlotte Gainsbourg. Uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg, who looks horrified, but also sort of fascinated by what is about to happen. Under the cover of trees, Claire's uncomfortable voyeurism is rewarded with this sudden crescendo of the Wagnerian orchestral score um, that accompanies the film at key moments from Tristan and Isolde. And we see this wide shot of Justine. She's lying naked on an outcrop of rock, undertaking a little bit of what looks like forest bathing, I guess. Um, under the aquamarine fluorescence of the approaching planet Melancholia, she gazes upwards and slowly caresses herself as her sister watches in disgust from beneath her canopy of trees. It's such a weird scene and it's so aestheticised, I think it asks us to try and understand what's going on in this film. And we can say definitely that this produces a kind of erotic encounter for Justine um, with her own impending death. Um, but it also inspires her, I think, to become a work of art, the way in which she's lying, the highly contrived position of her, of her figure looks like um, a, a nude from classical painting. But here she's, she's the subject, but she herself is the painter. She has engineered this um, position, this strange image, which I think combines a kind of libidinal investment in the very forces which are about to annihilate her. So, annihilation. Justine welcomes the weird weather, the eerie nocturnal glow of the approaching planet Melancholia, and also the vacillating atmospheric conditions making it difficult to breathe, which reminds us uncomfortably, I think, of auto-erotic asphyxiation. Um, but when her sister Claire is struggling to breathe, it seems much more like a panic attack, a panic of an oncoming uh, subjective annihilation. So if Justine is welcoming death, we have to think that this isn't just her own literal death, although it is that too, it's not just the death of the entire planet, which is about to be destroyed in the final moment of planetary collision. But more than that, it's a kind of symbolic um, liberation from a repressive social world. As Frederick Jameson famously quipped, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. So I think if Justine welcomes the planetary disaster, um, the film also makes it clear that she savours this imminent destruction of these capitalist bourgeois ties. And I think then, or what I, I'd like to suggest in all of these examples, is that these kinds of books and films, whilst they show us disasters, apocalyptic demises, um, whether caused by weather or viral pandemic um, or, or planetary collision in the case of melancholia, they also insist that something better might come out of the wreckage. And I think in these kind of really scary, um, dangerous coronavirus times, that might be a message worth hanging on to. Thank you very much.